Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Now, what you are looking at here is a satellite photo shortly after the Fukushima disaster in uh, Japan in 2011. And uh, this is on uh, Greenpeace's site here. And I will share, of course, all of the links in the video description. Now, but what I want you to look at is uh, these group of buildings here, three, and all of this forested area around the actual reactors. And then I want to take you to this shot. And you can see this three group of three buildings here and all of these massive containment tanks. Now, uh, this is from a picture in 2017. There's a picture that I will share in the description from 2019 that has more stringent copyright laws attached to it. Uh, but you can see by analyzing the two how the construction of tanks over here had been increased, the number of tanks here had been increased, these small tanks had been uh, replaced by much larger tanks, and that the area is really getting congested with tanks. Now, even in 2017, uh, they were saying experts want gradual release uh, of this contaminated water. Release where? Presumably the sea. Uh, but if the tanks break and the water, uh, the water would slosh out, yes, what would make the tanks break? I don't know, another typhoon, maybe another tsunami, um, maybe just failure of the tanks. Now, this is a real concern uh, because these contain uh, predominantly the worst uh, isotope in here is cesium-137. It's highly uh, toxic to humans and, and uh, higher organisms like uh, tuna and so forth uh, because it accumulates in the body and it has a half-life of around about 30 years and emits beta particles, uh, high energy, into your body and causes cancer. And uh, the idea of this going into the sea, uh, into a, a nation that relies on fish, but also into the Pacific, um, for anyone that's on the... Uh, west coast of America, or actually who likes fish, um, you know, the, the idea of this happening is, um, you know, absolutely, uh, uh, it's just abhorrent. And and uh, right now there is a dispute uh, between the Japanese government and the South Korean government about the uh, disposal of these uh, million tons, uh, it is now, uh, in excess of a million tons of uh, contaminated water. And really, one wonders why this situation was ever allowed to happen. Uh, because um, uh, the data that I was given today uh, by uh, Mr. Amaza, by our show, uh, really calls into the question why we should have this situation. Now, um, it's not just uh, liquid waste, but uh, if you go back to the uh, Greenpeace site here, there are dumps uh, over a so sort of uh, Fukushima prefecture of uh, millions of tons uh, of uh, uh, contaminated soil. Um, you know, we need, we need solutions for these. But also, it, it, and a lot of energy around the world is actually produced by nuclear, and there's an intention over the next uh, several decades to produce a lot more fission reactors. And if uh, the po public is going to uh, be happy with this, we should really, if we have a solution, deploy it um, so that we can consider uh, small nuclear uh, power stations powering small cities uh, safely uh, and uh, with modern technology uh, and, and have uh, less of a concern if something like this should happen, uh, God forbid. Now, so... Um, what I would like to show you here is if you go to uh, the uh, Nanosoft show element uh, data, uh, Philip Power has introduced uh, this new uh, feature where you can uh, add, uh, you know, choose your element. And it's all from publicly, publicly available data, which is uh, um, uh, the sources over here. But anyway, um, you can see that, for instance, uh, cesium. Uh, is normally uh, monoisotopic, uh, naturally, of 133 cesium. Uh, but the radioactive isotopes you typically get uh, from uh, nuclear waste are 134 cesium, which has a two-year uh, half-life, um, and uh, the majority of that comes out as a pretty nasty gamma ray. Uh, where are we? Uh, and then the uh, cesium-137 uh, here... 
Uh, where is it? Uh, well, I'll find it here. 137 there. Uh, that's got your 30 something year half life and uh, that produces uh, your beta uh, uh, particle. So um, those are the nasties. Now what actually happened was um, uh, in the 2000s uh, there was some sludge at the bottom of a Amasa vibrator system and uh, Mr. Amasa was wondering uh, what, what that was. So he sent it off for, to analysis and he found out that it, it was a, a large proportion of the per periodic table. A large number of elements had apparently uh, crept into his device from somewhere and could it be transmutation? Well after Fukushima happened uh, then uh, he uh, thought that p perhaps um, this could provide a solution uh, to uh, the aftermath of the disaster. So he took it upon himself to conduct a study and uh, there were politicians involved, there was a uh, TEPCO engineers apparently, this is what I'm told, I don't know but this is what I'm told, and there, were, uh, there was a TV crew that was filming it and they conducted a study and uh, uh, basically here we have uh, the data from that study that I was sent to today, uh, sent today and I translated it and it says here practical test results of detoxification treatment of radioactively contaminated water. So they obtained water from uh, Fukushima Prefecture and they put it into one of the vibration systems and uh, what you're looking at is something like this uh, uh, and so you have your plates like this uh, like this and they're vibrating up and down and um, you can see them doing here and this is on a 10 times slow motion effect. And um, what you can see is that for cesium-137, the really nasty isotope there with that 30 plus half-life, year half-life, um, that after just about 13 days, the, ha there has been a, an approximately a 50% reduction in uh, uh, activity from the uh, sample. And after 30 days, uh, there's been a 74%. So this effectively is one half-life, and this is effectively two half-lives over the original uh, activity. And so in, it, it's effectively doing a half-life every two weeks, or approximately every two weeks. And so rather than doing a half-life in 30 years, it's doing it in two weeks. Now, how many half-lives could we have done? This, this was conducted on in 2012, how many half-lives could we have done on that water that's in those storage tanks um, in the intervening time if this had actually been deployed? Now, it is interesting to note that the people that were doing the uh, testing with a germanium semiconductor here and, and an ICP uh, mass spectrometry uh, were the Citizen Radioactivity Measurement Station in Fukushima and then the Tokyo Food and Technology Research Institute. You would understand that these would be people that were interested in knowing the, the actual facts of a potential solution. Uh, uh, and what was very disappointing, the story I'm told, is that once this was all, um, you know, uh, the test showed this, this data, that, that um, it never went anywhere. Uh, the the uh, TV station was n never broadcasted for whatever reason. And you could wonder that, th that there was no potential uh, explanation for what they were observing here. And, you know, so should we go ahead with it? I, I don't know. Now, the interesting thing is that the barium goes up here in this period. Uh, and this... Uh, uh, looks to be a reaction where you would have uh, cesium-134 going to uh, barium-135 with a proton addition and uh, cesium-137 going to barium-138. And if you look at uh, barium again on uh, the uh, uh, nanosoft.co.nz uh, show element data uh, tables, you can see that uh, barium-135 uh, and 138 are both stable elements. And 138, interestingly, is uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, it is the highest proportion element uh, uh, isotope for barium. Okay, so, um, so we have a, a potential solution here. And uh, uh, just for a, a, a check, they did a, an, an element uh, conversion test from cesium to barium and platinum with a cesium chloride. Um, and this is uh, reagent grade, so this is uh, normal uh, sort of cesium uh, chloride, and so it has the monoisotopic cesium-133. 
Now, the, the interesting point here is um, that uh, there doesn't seem to be much change. There is a, an increase in, in uh, uh, barium here, but as was observed with the biological transmutation of Kulinova and uh, Vysotsky, uh, what happens is the barium goes up and then it starts to tail off. And, uh, you know, I discussed with him at uh, ICCF20 in, in the... Uh, Japan, uh, you know, that this would be making barium and then it's stepping along the uh, lanthanides. So the, you actually get a peak and then it progresses on. Um, the interesting thing is there really isn't that massive a change here. Now, this fits into my understanding that uh, essentially uh, if nature wants to naturally do a transmutation, from uh, something that's unstable to stable. You, you know this because that's what nature does. <laughs> uh, it, it's not trying to make unstable things uh, even more unstable. It, it's, it decays, doesn't it, to stability. Now, the thing about um, uh, uh, what was said by uh, Tesla in 1932 in The Sun uh, that I reported on before and, and the work of uh, Xu Wenzhou uh, looking at atomic clocks powered by cesium-137 and uh, the work of Filimenenko uh, uh, reported in uh, from the 1950s where uh, uh, isotopes and, and many other people reporting beta isotope decays uh, acceleration uh, due to uh, uh, low energy nuclear reactions uh, and, and similar technologies. Um, this is a beta isotope, uh, so this is the same cesium-137 that is in that Xu Wenzhou work, which appears to be some sort of neutrino effect. Now, if it is, as Tesla was saying in 1932, cosmic rays slash neutrinos that are causing all radioactive decay. If you could get something that condenses those and increases uh, the likelihood of interaction between the radionuclide and the actual neutrinos that could facilitate the weak interaction, you could have this decay faster and the rate of change of element would be faster depending on its uh, stability. Now, some people may actually uh, start to understand why I took um, uh, indium and why I took uh, uh, calcium carbonate and, and uh, uh, why I took uh, charcoal uh, to test in various uh, reactors over there, as well as... Um, uh, neodymium uh, and boron. Uh, these things uh, I will make very much more clearer in my presentations in the coming weeks. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, the interesting thing is here with the, with the stable element, it's really not, it is changing. So this is showing, like, if, if we are assuming that an EVO can uh, take a, a, a proton and uh, 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 inject that into another nucleus, if that's how it is occurring, if, if, if we're assuming that, that would be the active agent that's uh, performing this uh, change, then um, it has to work a lot harder to transmute a stable element to, let's say, another stable element, because if we look at... Um, barium-134, uh, we've got barium-134, it is another stable element. Um, so it's, it's having to work a lot harder, but it can actually do it. But if the element is unstable to begin with, uh, then uh, there is a desire for that to change by nature already. And if you increase its propensity to uh, um, want to change, uh, by giving it the means to do that change, then it occurs much, much faster. So um, this is why I took a range of isotope uh, uh, whole, um, containing materials uh, to test, and in the coming weeks we will know whether anything interesting really happened. Uh, 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 particularly, I'm interested in our uh, indium here, uh, which is exposed to the Amasa gas, and the indium here, which was exposed to the uh, vibration system for 10 minutes. Has there been any changes in those things? Now, at the time, it, it could have been that they didn't really have a reason for this uh, uh, sort of change in uh, activity of the radioisotope um, uh, to occur. So they kind of dismissed it as maybe some measurement error. But uh, what we established quite quickly um, when we were there is that... Uh, 
that the actual system, even though it's vibrating at, say, 179 hertz, it's actually producing cavitation bubbles. And you can see these moving around here and, uh, uh, you know, joining each other in a similar way to that which we saw in uh, actual ultrasonic systems from the get-go in Suhas Ralkar's lab in 2017. So um, this is slowed down by 10 times. You can see this video. It's called uh, Copper Chloride Fins. Uh, slow motion, early high resolution. So you can see these uh, uh, bubbles moving around and interacting uh, with each other. And so um, it, and we measured with a, a hydrophone that it is ultrasonic. So we know that there's ultrasonics going on. So this could lead to cavitation. And then we found the cavitation spots in the fins, and we can and we discussed the fact that. Um, that uh, because there's a wide area here and because it's, it's not only moving up and down like that with a more deflection in the middle, but it's also moving a bit like that. Um, there's a wide parameter space here for um, the right condition to occur to produce an effect. Now, um, I have some other good news today other than receiving this data. Uh, Mr. Amaza has agreed that we can keep these fins uh, rather than having to try and look at them whole and then return them. What this means is we will be able to uh, choose parts of these, cut them up and send them off for analysis of these uh, spots to find out if there's been any transmutation and to get a better understanding of the form of the damage uh, that's being caused by the supposed cavitation. So that's it. Uh, I were as ever the data for this and uh, the links will be in the description to the video uh, and i would really like to see this process if it is valid uh trying uh, uh to be deployed to fix what was caused here and is uh, currently residing in these tanks by uh, the many many thousands well over a million tons of uh, liquid uh, of contaminated form so uh, that's it really so thank you very much for your time and i look forward to seeing you in the next video